Hi there, I'm Leif Olson with the University of Oklahoma, and I'm going to tell you about surveying microbes from a mine drainage bioreactor with cultivation and genetic techniques. First of all, I want to thank the International Water Conference for having me speak here. I appreciate the opportunity. I am a graduate student with the Center for Restoration of Ecosystems and Watersheds in the School of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science at the University of Oklahoma, which is run by Dr. Robert Nairn. This project is also done in collaboration with two labs from the Department of Microbiology and Plant Biology at OU, the De Leon lab uh, run by Dr. Kara De Leon, as well as the Institute of Environmental Genomics run by Dr. Ji Zhang Zhou, and a graduate student there, Yu Peng Fan, who helped with the environmental DNA part of the project. Here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about, give a little bit of a background, then talk about the methods used in the study and some preliminary results, and then we'll get into some questions and answers. So first, mine drainage treatment bioreactors. Here's the study site where this project was performed. It's in the Tar Creek Superfund site in Northeast Oklahoma, an old legacy mining district, uh, primarily uh, lead and zinc. On the left there, we have a repository of mine tailings. On the right, that's uh, one of the mine seeps coming out of the ground. And you can see we have very orange water, lots of iron, lots of metals and sulfate and various things that impair the water quality. The crew lab has been uh, working to address this contamination using passive treatment systems. This one is at a site called Mayer Ranch. You can see the water is going from left to right, going from very orange to very clear. And I want to focus in this presentation on these treatment ponds in the middle here, these vertical flow bioreactors. So what are they? Well, that story first will go to the JM Farms, a mushroom farm in Miami, Oklahoma, down the road from Mayer Ranch, where they produce 500,000 pounds a week of various types of culinary mushrooms. But when they're done growing the mushrooms on this compost-based substrate you can see here, they leave it out in piles so that people can pick it up and do various things with it. And one of those things is to use it as a mind drainage treatment medium. So this is the pond, the uh, vertical flow bioreactor pond that I focused on in this study. You just see kind of water on the surface, but underneath that water is a mixture of the mushroom compost along with wood chips, and the water comes in through the top, it flows through the substrate vertically down through drains in the bottom, and it passed into a very anaerobic uh, environment and on its way. This is what the substrate looks like if you dig it up. I should say that this pond has been there for about 14 years. So over time, the mushroom compost and wood chips starts to turn into this kind of goopy sludge looking material. Why is this important for removing metals from mine water? A lot of it has to do with these sulfate reducing bacteria. There's a lot of different types of sulfate reducing bacteria or SRB, and they're pretty common and ubiquitous throughout any anaerobic environments around the world. But what uh, unifies them all, what makes them all similar, is that they take inorganic sulfate, the most oxidized form of inorganic sulfur, and reduce it down to sulfide, the most reduced form of inorganic sulfur, as a terminal electron acceptor in, a, in their anaerobic respiration. So they basically use sulfate instead of oxygen to breathe. Now, interestingly, when this process happens, the sulfide can bind with soluble metal ions and then precipitate them into solids, thus removing them from the effluent of the bioreactor. Here's some pictures of them growing in test tubes. And once again, you see those black iron sulfide precipitates. The goals of this project were to try to cultivate some SRB from the Mayor Ranch PTS VFBR. We're getting all into acronym territory here. Also to assess the microbial communities using genomic analysis, see if there's any overlap between what we can grow in the lab and what seems prominent from genetic survey, and also to characterize the strains that we can grow in the lab. So I'm gonna go over some of the methods used in this study. First, at the sample collection, which is one of the most important parts of any environmental microbiology study, 
especially when we're working with anaerobes, because I need to get my samples from this treatment pond to the labs at University of Oklahoma, which is about three and a half hours away, and try to maintain the reasonably anaerobic conditions in the process. So unfortunately, this material does not lend itself to using a soil core. You try to stick a core in there and the material just slides right out. So I just had to get down and dirty and open up a 50 ml centrifuge tube and shove it down into the substrate, fill it up, close it up. And then on the right here, you can see under my knee, there's this plastic box. And what that's for is I took the samples, put them in there, put the airtight lid on the top, along with a little satchel of material that removes the oxygen from the inside of the box. And so this anaerobic box kind of helps keep somewhat anaerobic conditions until we actually do the cultivation in the lab. For the environmental DNA samples, we put them into a cooler on dry ice so the sample gets frozen immediately. Then we store it in a minus 80 degree Celsius freezer. And that way we're kind of creating a snapshot of what's happening with the DNA when the sample is collected. We performed elemental analysis. I'm not really going to get into that in this presentation, but we took some of the substrate dried it up, ground it up, and looked at the metals and nutrients in it. For the cultivation side, as I mentioned, they had these samples in this anaerobic box, and we grew them in an anaerobic glove bag, which you can see on the right, where it has an atmosphere of nitrogen gas to keep it so there's close to no oxygen inside of there. We used anaerobic cultivation media, which to make that, I had to um, get the liquid that we're adding the different nutrients and things for the bacteria to grow and the electron acceptors, electron donors. And you can see all these lines that are going into the liquid. And once again, they are pumping nitrogen gas into the media to keep it anaerobic. I took the samples I collected in the field, diluted them a little, create a slurry, then extract that slurry out of the tubes with a syringe. You can see the syringe with the uh, inoculum there on the right take that inoculum syringe and inject it into the media tubes that I'd made. And then we let them incubate for a while. Once you see signs of growth, put them into fresh media. And this is that fresh media there. And once again, you can see the SRV growing because you have the black iron sulfide precipitates. Another sign of growth is that if you can pull out a little sample and smell it, usually you get that sulfide rotten eggs odor and the nose nose, as they say. Once we have some nice cultures grown out in the liquid medium. There's still probably a lot of different types of microbes living in there. So to do the isolation, we move to Petri dishes and we have the agar on the left. We're sticking it into the glove bag. We take a sample out with a syringe, do a cereal dilution. And then from the cereal dilutions, we pipette those samples into the bottom of Petri dishes, pour the agar on top of them, mix them up and then let them cool down. This is important to do a pour over method like this with SRB because they don't really grow well if they uh, are streaked on top of the medium, partially because they're anaerobic and you want them embedded in the medium and not getting exposed to too much air. We did incubate them once again in one of these anaerobic boxes, try to keep the oxygen levels down. And once they've grown out nicely, you can see that dish on the left has some good prominent black iron sulfide colonies. Then take a sterile toothpick, poke the colony, take the toothpick, stick into a little tube of liquid media, take that liquid media, put it into a larger tube of liquid media. And on the right, you can see it's cloudy, it's dark. It's what we're looking for with sulfate reducing bacteria. And that's what we do the analysis with. For the environmental DNA survey, so we get a container full of liquid nitrogen, if you're wondering what's going on on the right there. And we chip off some subsamples from the frozen samples, add the liquid nitrogen, grind them up, put them into a DNA extraction kit. So that's what these are, it's little columns here. The brown is our sample. The white stuff on the bottom is the materials from the extraction kit that will break apart the cells, release the DNA. And then the liquid is the buffer solution. Once we've done the extraction, we do lots of pipetting, lots of PCR here on the left. That's the thermocycler doing the PCR. We're amplifying the 16S ribosomal RNA gene in this setting. And then once we have that done, we run it out on a gel on the right. You can see a little blue band. Cut that out, extract the DNA with that, and then that's what's sequenced for the environmental DNA analysis. So there's a lot of methods going on here. But what have we learned from it so far? On the cultivation side of things, I was able to get 70 viable cultures, meaning that 
can put them in a minus 80 degree freezer, pull them out and grow them successfully. Of those 38 of them, so over, a little over half of them had aerobic contaminants, meaning that there are aerobic microbes living in the culture. Even though it was cultivated in anaerobic settings the whole time, there's likely facultative anaerobes that were in there. And you can see, we can tell this by doing uh, LC glucose check. This is an agar plate with very nutrient-rich sugary media that basically any aerobic bacteria is going to be able to grow on. And so you can see on the top, we had some growing on the bottom, not so much. The ones that didn't have aerobic contamination, they sequenced the 16S gene of those ones. And four of them were still mixed cultures, even though they're all anaerobes, but four of them appeared to be isolates. So those four on the right, those are the colony ID uh, convention naming that I'd come up with, in case you were curious. Of those four colonies, if we look at their 16S genes, they're very similar, all over 99% the same. This one at the bottom, 99.19, a little less similar. Interestingly, that one was sampled a few hundred feet away from the other three. And it also, the medium it was in was slightly different. It had thiosulfate instead of sulfate as its electron acceptor. So what are they? Uh, from doing a blast search, we got a lot of very similar uh, organisms showing up in the databases. And lots of them were over 99% similar, and pretty much all of them were disulfovibrio disulfuricans, if they had been identified. Of these, three had their genomes fully sequenced. All the fully sequenced genomes occurred within the last four years. Uh, there's interestingly one uh, that not fully sequenced, but it was 99% plus similar, and it was actually from the University of Oklahoma duck pond on campus. So these bacteria, they occur all over the place. They're found in wetland sediments swine waste lagoons inside of mammal intestines all over the place. In terms of the eDNA, we're still kind of in the early phases of this. We analyzed one of the seven samples collected. We did 12 subsamples. You can see them all there uh, getting shaken on a little, little shaker tray there. From that one sample, these are the 12 subsamples, and these are the taxa present in it. You can see it's Firmicutes is the dominant one. Then we have a lot of delta proteobacteria, which that is the group that most sulfate reducing bacteria belong to and pretty much all the sulfate reducing bacteria that don't belong to delta proteobacteria belong to firmicutes so it looks like looks like they're there on the genus level if you look at the top of this page we have a lot of bacillus which is a facultative anaerobe maybe that's what the aerobic contaminants in the cultures were we have several different disulfa type of bacteria which means that they are sulfate reducers so uh, not a lot of overlap, though, with uh, the sulfovibrio. The next steps in this project are to obviously sequence the remaining enrichment cultures, extract and sequence the rest of the environmental DNA substrate samples, and then perhaps compare the metal removal abilities of the isolates I've gathered from the bioreactor to similar strains that were collected from less metal contaminated environments. These are the publications that were referenced throughout this presentation, and I have a lot of people to thank, a lot of acknowledgments, the lab PIs uh, who allowed this to happen, Dr. Nairn, Dr. DeLeon, Dr. Joe, our funding partners, the NSF, the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, the Grand River Dam Authority, who all made this possible, the views and conclusions, findings expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of them, and also I have to thank uh, various research collaborators, everyone in the crew, IEG and De Leon labs from crew, specifically David Wilcox, who helped with the sample collection at Mayer Ranch, uh, Justine McCann and Mackenzie Dorman, who helped with the elemental analysis of the substrate samples from the IEG Yupeng Fan, who helped with all the environmental DNA analysis, and then Pete Pickens from the De Leon lab, who assisted in a wide array of cultivation and molecular biology uh, techniques. Well, thanks for listening, and now I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has.